uh, invite saya bagi talk hari ni. Um, initially I thought, oh dear, what am I going to talk about? Gestational diabetes. But when I was doing the slides, actually there's many 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 things that uh, sampai rasa macam tak cukup masa lah 30 minit ni. Eh? Okay, so without uh, further ado, I'm going to talk about diagnostic criteria. Uh, but before that, I'm going to talk a little bit on carb and lipid metabolism in pregnancy so that you can understand how GDM comes about and why do we need to treat hyperglycemia in pregnancy. Then a little bit on updates on definition and diagnosis and how it came about. And I hope to summarize by the end of the 30 minutes. <clears throat> so, if you read the papers on GDM, you'll be confused. Maybe you're smart people, you won't be confused. But I was very confused because there's so many uh, diabetes organizations. Yeah? Uh, America will say one thing, Europe will say another thing, UK wants their own guidelines. So we in Malaysia don't know which to follow, so we take half-half. Okay? Uh, the, the site that is showing uh, the landmark trial, HAPO, and subsequently the task unit to develop uh, different criteria. Okay? So when I mention after this, you will know uh, whether it's an organization body or a task force. So how do we define uh, gestational diabetes? Previously, um, before the year 2000 and above, it was defined as any degree of glucose intolerance with onset of first recognition during pregnancy. But we know that's not true, right? When the ladies come to us at 8 or 9 weeks gestation, especially when you refer and the A1Cs are already 8 or 9, it cannot be gestational diabetes. You will understand why when I talk about the physiology later. Yeah. So, the, new, the current question is, uh, the same as before, glucose intolerance first recognized during pregnancy, whether or not the condition persists after pregnancy, you are well aware of that. But there's another section which says that it's not overt diabetes. That means based on the A1Cs, you should know whether, uh, and also on the OGTT criteria, you should know whether this is overt diabetes or this is gestational diabetes. Yeah? Right, so let's clear overt diabetes out of the way. When do we say this is overt diabetes? When the fasting is more than 7, when the random is more than 11.1, and the A1Cs are more than 6.5. Everyone is clear on that, kan? Right? Okay. Okay, let's look at prevalence. Just now, uh, Tuan Pengurusi Majlis kata 10%. You in ONG what? Do you think it's 10%? How many do you think it is? 40-50%, wow. <laughs> Okay, the prevalence is higher in Malaysia because, as you know, Malaysia is the most obese country in Asia. Yeah? Malaysia also has the highest number of fast-rising diabetes throughout Western Pacific and Asia. Yeah? Okay, so this slide just shows the interquartile range from different continents and look at that Southeast Asia the uh, pre the median is about 11.7 yeah but let's look here can you see this is Malaysia this is the color, the different color codes are according to whether it's diagnosed using WHO criteria uh, ECOC criteria NDDG criteria Houston and Houston uh, criteria or IDPE uh, ID APSG, which is International Association for the Diabetes in Pregnancy Study Group. Yeah? But Malaysia is colored under others. Chocolate. Why? Because we follow no criteria. <laughs> it's true. Before this, correct me if I'm wrong, but different states were using their own values, right? So when the, the uh, investigator wanted to collect data, they just based on Diagnose GDM or not, but don't know which criteria. Kelantan uses a different criteria, Selangor uses a different criteria. Uh, okay, so, uh, but it states here in Southeast Asia, Malaysia had the highest prevalence of 18.3%, yeah, which is higher than the median. So, um, this is looking 
our own uh, consultants here, Dr. Roshan, uh, Dr. Moriza, Dr. Hatika previously. So they studied and they produced this paper in 2009 and it showed that the range from 18.3 to 24.9. Yeah? So is that high? That is high. That's like saying one in four, between one in six to one in four of pregnant ladies is having diabetes. Yeah? So, national uh, prevalence, uh, I'm showing you this is for diabetes, yeah? This is not for GDM. The world prevalence is 2.8. But look at Malaysia's prevalence. It's going up and up and up. Yeah? Because in 2016, the latest uh, NHMS, showed one in six individuals have got diabetes and in Kedah state, it is one in four, 25.4%. So every one in four are having diabetes. Yeah. So that is actually a direct translation from your, the GDM population, right? You become GDM and then you carry a higher risk to develop full-blown type 2 diabetes later on. Yeah. And Malaysians consume 26 teaspoons of sugar. <coughs> is that a lot? Put, uh, go back after this, take a bowl, scoop up 26 teaspoons of sugar and see how much that looks like. It is a lot. yeah. So, of course, we don't eat sugar like that, but it is inside the, the carbohydrate uh, food that we take. yeah. So, let's look at pathophysiology. In GDM, a combination of insulin resistance and pancreatic beta cell dysfunction comes into play yeah so why this happens is in early pregnancy the estrogen and progesterone will cause increase in insulin secretion there's hyperinsulinemia so it promotes for fat storage and lipogenesis yeah so in early pregnancy that's what happens so in early pregnancy the human placenta lactogen and all is not taking place so much yeah Later on, as the placenta develops and the fetus is developing, then you have more of increased insulin resistance because the human placental lactogen, the placental growth hormone, the cortisol, the prolactin, everything will start to increase by mid-second trimester. So that's why when you catch people too early, uh, <coughs> when they are diagnosed about their 8 or 9 weeks, it is unlikely this patient is a true GDM. Most likely, they are already having undiagnosed type 2 diabetes from earlier on, yeah? Okay, so, uh, apart from the hormonal increase which causes resistance, there's also the inflammatory cytokines and adipokines, yeah? From the placenta, which causes resistance. So, this resistance by mid-second trimester is actually very important because what happens is the glucose uh, uptake to the fetus, uh, nutrients, 80% comes from glucose. Only another 20% will come from amino acids and from the product of lipolysis. Okay? So to maintain that, the resistance to the mother has to be higher so that more glucose goes through the placenta to the fetus. Understand? Okay? This is normal physiology. Yeah? But because a lot of glucose in the first trimester, when a lot of glucose is channeled towards the fetus, what will the mother have? The mother will have hypoglycemia. Especially when they are vomiting and nausea and not eating, you know. Then the, um, the hypoglycemia will come about and there's also increased production of lipolysis. So ketosis will take place. Yeah? Breakdown of triglyceride will produce free fatty acid as well as um, glycerol. So glycerol will go through the pathway of gluconeogenesis substrate. Yeah, glycerol is a substrate for glucose production through non-carbo material. Okay? Whereas free fatty acid will produce ketone bodies. So you get ketosis. Yeah? Alright? So this hepatic gluconeogenesis is also very important because if the mother is getting hypos, it is nature's way of making sure the hypo does not last. So the hepatic gluconeogenesis pathway has to be activated. Then only the sugar will come back to normal. Right? Okay? Okay.
Are you feeling a bit lost? Okay, I see a lot of like question mark on the head. <laughs> okay, so uh, again I recap, first trimester of pregnancy, in, there's increased insulin sensitivity. So there's a lot of insulin secretion because, uh, and also the, the extra glucose will go to the fetus, but because of this, glucose are lower for the mother because maternal blood volume increase and there's also uptake by the fetus, yeah? But remember, when the glucose is higher, the insulin secretion is also higher. So what does insulin secretion do? Insulin secretion will promote for fat storage in the mother. So that later on, when uh, the body cannot cope anymore, it will lysis this uh, glycogen and, and um, fat to produce substrate for the mother and the fetus. Okay? Right, so in normal pregnancy, by, by mid-second trimester, there's already increase in insulin resistance and also reduction in insulin secretion, correct? But in people with normal pancreas, the pancreas can cope. It will produce 200 to 300 times more insulin secretion so that it will drive the glucose for the mother's metabolism as well as for the baby. But in a patient who is either already had pre-gestational diabetes, meaning they are undiagnosed, but maybe something is already wrong with their pancreas, or they are manifesting now because uh, the load, the diabetogenic load of the hormones plus the baby is causing their, their diabetes status to manifest, that is exactly what happens. The pancreas cannot cope with the increased resistance. Yeah, so normal people, normal pregnancy, pancreas can cope, you go throughout pregnancy without GDM. But when the pancreas cannot cope because the resistance is too high, insulin secretion is impaired, the patient will have GDM. Understand? Okay? So accelerated starvation is actually bukan puasa, eh? Accelerated starvation is when the patient sleeps at night until morning. So actually it's called accelerated starvation. And because the fetus, they still want nutrients. Some, my professor last time told me fetuses are parasites, right? They want the glucose because they, they have no other means of getting the glucose. So they want the glucose no matter what happens. So it is very important that the fetal placental glucose demand is met. That's why it, during, as, during sleeping time, there is, method, there is like policies yeah, to give uh, rise to gluconeogenesis so that glucose will be produced to supply the fetus, okay? Because remember, in accelerated starvation, you are not eating. So the glucose is already down, right? But you're getting your glucose supply from your fat, from your proteins, from everywhere else, okay? Okay, right. So what we need to know, after, uh, after the delivery, when there's removal of all these diabetogenic uh, things, from the body, the insulin sensitivity returns. So a lady might only manifest GDM during pregnancy. Tapi kalau enam kali pregnant ada GDM, will it put them at risk? Tak payah enam kali. Kalau dua kali pun, sekali pun puts them at risk. Yeah? Okay? Basically, GDM is a warning sign that you are prone to get diabetic, diabetes when your resistance is going higher. So in ladies, only with resistance, only develop diabetes later on. Yeah? So why do we need to treat hyperglycemia in pregnancy? So the impact of maternal hyperglycemia, yeah? When there's maternal hyperglycemia, the uh, glucose will go to the fetus through the placenta, right? So how does the placenta, how does the fetus's placenta cope with this high glucose? It produces more insulin, very good, yeah? So when there's uh, so the beta cells hypertrophy, the islet, set, islet cells hyperplasia inside it. So the pancreas becomes big and it's used to stimulating insulin all the time. So that's why after delivery, the fetus will go into hypoglycemia. The, ne the neonate will go into hypoglycemia because the fetus is used to producing excess insulin. Okay? Alright. So um, what this does is, there's already maternal programming inside the fetus, when the, when the pancreatic uh, fetus pancreas is already overstimulated then, it, the program in the baby is already designed that later on they will develop obesity as well as diabetes. 
which puts them at the risk of cardiovascular disease in later life, yeah? Right, so uh, this is what I was talking about just now. And another aspect is the because the, the pancreas grows larger, the baby grows larger because you know insulin is anabolic, so it when excess insulin in the mother, it makes the fat become stored in the lady, right? In the fetus, it makes the fat become stored in the baby as well, correct? So that causes macrosomia, okay? And it also, because this insulin is passing through the placenta, the placenta also becomes enlarged. So all this will reduce the oxygen tissue supply and they become hypoxic. That's why sometimes when, in cases of uh, IUDs and all, there is, when they examine the placenta, you can see areas of necrosis inside there, yeah? Because the, the placenta cannot cope with the hypoxia due and two to the already baby and too big uh, placenta. Yeah? All right. Okay, this was what I was uh, talking about just now. Yeah, fetal programming. So they become metabolic syndrome in the adult and even teenagers and even children. Yeah? Children as early as 10 years old, uh, PITS always refer now for obesity and diabetes. Yeah? So it's not uncommon anymore. They are no longer type 1, yeah? Okay. Alright, so we go on to screening. Why do we screen? Of course, to detect and treat and avoid complications. And how do we screen? 75 grams glucose in 200 ml of water, yeah? So the question now is when and who do we screen? That is the controversy, yeah? So, um... There are some guidelines which say screen everybody. Universal screening, okay? Because the prevalence of diabetes is going higher. There are also maybe guidelines which say self screening, yeah? Because maybe the population, their population, there's not much prevalence of diabetes, so they only look at risk factors to screen. The timing, early, upon diagnosis, uh, upon first presentation to KK, as opposed to at 24 to 28 weeks. 24 to 28 is taken because this is the time after mid trimester, second trimester, this is the time where the insulin resistance will go up and the pancreas cannot cope anymore. Yeah? So if we screen early, we, are, we might be looking at populations already with undiagnosed type 2 diabetes, but we need to treat them accordingly. Yeah? There's the one step versus two step approach. And criteria for diagnosis, the recommendation from international organization are not standardized. So again, when to screen Malaysia, uh, our Malaysian CPG uh, in 2015 and 17 uh, states that universal screening should be performed if there is enough resource. Yeah? Otherwise, screen individuals at high risk. If, they, if those at high risk have normal result, then repeat OGTT should be done between 24 to 28 weeks. So you all know the risk factors for JDM uh, screening. I will skip this. Now we come to diagnosis. Yeah. So one of the 10 main changes in the CPG in 2015 states that hyperglycemia in pregnancy, which includes GDM and type 2 diabetes. Yeah? Those are the new changes uh, to the CPG. So the Malaysian uh, diagnostic criteria for GDM according to Malaysian CPG is 5.1 for fasting and 7.8. This is unique because as usual, Malaysia wants to be different in terms of diabetes. Yeah? Our HbA1c criteria is lower our BMIs are lower upon diagnosis, yeah? So taking into account all that, the two hours value actually follows NICE guidelines, whereas the fasting follows IADPSG. Okay? Alright, so the previously diagnosis of uh, DM in pregnancy in Malaysia was uh, after 2015, it was based on the 5, 6, 7, 8, yeah? All of you have found that, yeah? Okay, before that, we were using the WHO criteria, 7 and 7.8. Okay? So, what is HAPO and how did this new guideline comes about? So, all of you have heard of HAPO, right? It's hyperglycemia and adverse pregnancy outcome. They studied about 23,000 pet subjects between mother and child from two, the year 2000 right up to 2006, yeah? 
and after analysis, they produced the paper in 2008, and it is a landmark study because it looked at criteria. Previously, people were looking at diagnosis of DM criteria, but then they were looking, they were dividing the patients into different cohorts based on lower and lower blood sugars. So it starts with fasting of about four, and. 4.3, 4.6, 4.9, yeah, until normal values. And they were looking what happened. There were four primary outcomes. They were looking at the baby's weight to see whether it's a macrosomic baby or not. They were looking at the cot uh, C peptide values. They were looking at the C section rate and also neonatal hypoglycemia. So it changes a lot of things because at levels lower than previously sought, they were catching a lot of people at risk. Uh, to develop adverse events of pregnancy. Because bear in mind, previously, all the criteria were looking at the future risk of diabetes in the mother. Yeah? HAPO actually look at what are the perinatal outcomes to the fetus. That is the difference. Okay? Right. Um, so this, uh, this is the column. I don't know if you can see from there. But basically, the blue one shows, uh, the dark blue shows fasting levels. One hour is uh, the lighter blue and two hours is the yellow line. So for C-peptide and for birth weight as well as C-section, it shows that although they were looking up to normal levels, even lower than normals, it starts to go up. Yeah, the, the, There was significant uh, risk in that pregnancy. So uh, this paper shows the <laughs> new diagnostic criteria. So after that, HAPO didn't make any recommendation. Yeah? So they left it to a task force unit, the IADPSG, to come up with another guideline on how they should diagnose these patients. Yeah? So, right, so diagnosis of uh, GDM using the IADPSG. I will show you the two or three different criteria. Yeah? So a single value, you, you have seen the, slide, the graph just now, right? So you can see that it's going up simultaneously. The level of sugars at fasting, one hour, two hours, everything is rising, right? Okay. So it states that a single value out of three measurements, either it's a fasting, one or two hours, performed between 24 to 28 weeks of gestation, and higher than that value is considered to be diabetes in pregnancy. Yeah? GDM. So they took levels of fasting at about five, one hour of 10 and two hours more than 8.5. Yeah? So there are a few organizations which follow, like ADA, Endo Society, and WHO. There were a few who reject, like the American College of Gynecology and a few countries. And Malaysia is half-half. Half from IADPSG, half from uh, NICE. Yeah? Okay. So this is the screening test, the two-step screening test. So the ladies will be screened after uh, 50 grams of glucose, one hour. Anyone more than 7.8 at one hour considered abnormal, so proceed with 100 grams OGTT. This is the ECOP criteria. Yeah? And these are the levels according to Carpenter and Houston or the National Diabetes Data Group. Uh, so this is a better summary. ADA has taken both options between one step and the IADPSG criteria or this one, uh, the two step, yeah. And National Institute of Health took the two steps, yeah. And Endo Society took one step. Okay. Right, so I have summarized the major ones. So this is looking at Malaysian CPG, we are following IADPSG because the ECOP states 5.3. But two hours later, we are following the NICE guidelines. Yeah? So those are the differences between these uh, guidelines. Right, so we go on to management. SMBG is very important during pregnancy. Why? Because we don't really like to base on HbA1c's. A lot of things can affect management then, yeah. So we ask them to monitor. We don't have access to fructosamine so much, yeah. Okay, so the glycemic targets, remember, someone who is fasting, 5.3, one uh, two hours post meal, usually 6.7. So we like to stick to these targets to make sure uh, less risk of uh, adverse events in the fetus, yeah, and the mother. 
So nutrition is important no, uh, for normal glycemia, provide adequate nutrition and so that you don't go into ketosis. <coughs> And allow weight gain, all of you know this, if they are overweight, and I think most of our patients are overweight and obese, so we only allow about 8 to 10 kilos weight gain, which I don't think many of them achieve, right? Okay. Okay, so this is looking at cup content, yeah? So what we do, and some of the ONGMOs who we run combined clinic together, they already know how to apply this. So important, we teach patient, first, reckon. Tell me how many classes of food there are. What is the carb in your diet? They must write down, do homework. What is the carbo? So then they must do carbo exchange. This way is very effective. Because a person who's taking 25 carbo exchange in a day without changing the insulin, if they drop their carbs to about 15 grams a day, uh, sorry, 15 carbo exchanges a day, their blood sugar improves tremendously. But we teach them to eat the right choice of food. So that instead of Wasted calorie, wasted carbs. For example, makan kuih, which tak kenyang pun kena makan kuih banyak banyak kan. Ah, uh, uh, goreng pisang siapa makan satu mesti makan lima. So they waste carbs on that, right? So we teach them to eat good carbs, which actually cheat, uh, cheats your stomach. You feel full longer, and the sugar rise is not there. Yeah. Avoid these types of food. Wait until after nine months, then you can eat. Then you come to me, not to the ONG consultants. And your baby suspect. Okay? Tahan, tahan. Okay? Alright. Okay. So this is what we advise them. There's quarter suku-suku separuh. Eh? Suku protein, suku cup, suku uh, setengah pinggan, fiber. Alright? Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, again. Suku-suku separuh. And breakfast can be, this is cup. That's the fiber and the protein content inside there. Which is as filling instead of makan nasi lemak, roti canai, okay? Alright, so this is controversies regarding uh, when to start therapy, type of initial therapy, dose and frequency. So you can see metformin because we follow NICE quite a bit. They advocated metformin whereas the other guidelines says insulin, yeah? Alright, so OADs, we know metformin and GDN not associated with any birth defects, preeclampsia or adverse maternal or fetal outcomes. Yeah? Only they could be, terms, uh, be worse in terms of preterm birth. Yeah? Uh, this is from the metformin versus insulin treatment uh, group. About half of the patients taking metformin eventually will require insulin. Alright, okay, so i just like to stress a point here. Start 6 units of short acting, but do not exceed 16 units of uh, TDS. This is not my regime, it's inside the Malaysian CPG. So for Malaysian uh, women's body surface area, if you give more than 16, it will make the patients feel very hungry. Okay, so they will eat more. So actually you are the causing the baby to be macrosomic. Okay, so stop at 16, but then use 50-50 ratio. If you use 16, that means you have to give 48 units of basal insulin. So, of course, we are not advocating you go there. You control other things first. Start, if they are GDM, you can actually start at 0.3 and 0.4 units and slowly build up. This is more for type 2 DM. Okay? But at, at 0.9 or 1 unit, please revise back. Do not keep increasing the insulin. Do not give... 16, 16, 16, 16. Because the basal insulin is needed to prevent excess hepatic gluconeogenesis. Alright? And it controls the in-between meals glucose. Okay? So this is just to show malformations are not related to type of insulin. And please, since I'm here and we're talking about insulin, inject in the abdomen. The subcutaneous tissue is more there. Absorption is better. And if patient moves or just lie in bed, it doesn't affect rate of absorption. It will not reach your baby. Yeah? Uh, this is showing, uh, they look at uh, adipocytes tissue uh, in the abdomen. And this is relative. This is how uh, the average compared to 4 millimeters needle. So it will never go to the baby. Ensure the mother that. Yeah? Can I have just two more minutes? Okay, this is looking at GDM clinical predictors. You can see that the graph is rising. Yeah? And it shows that in South Indian women population, there's a 23-fold greater rise 
than non-GDM counterparts to develop diabetes. And there's also a range from 2.6 to 70% over 6 weeks to 28 years postpartum, this study looking long term. Yeah? And these are some new insights looking at metabolites and um, what do you call it, hormones for development of diabetes, GDM. So actually GDM is a field entirely on its own. Yeah? So this is my second last slide. To summarize, GDM develops when the insulin secretion cannot cope with degree of insulin resistance during pregnancy. Okay, you have to understand that. And GDM is associated with adverse maternal, fetal as well as neonatal outcomes. And the HAPO study resulted in IDPSG diagnostic criteria recommendation, but this is not accepted by all societies, so it depends. Like Malaysia, will take the post to be lower because our prevalence is higher. So that's fair, I think, yeah? So in the Malaysian CPG, uh, yeah, uh, the baseline glucose follows, but because our prevalence is higher, so we are taking uh, the lower rate for two hours post meals. And metformin is advocated to be used in GDM patients. And I cannot stop telling you how education on recognition of carbs and exchanges needs to be emphasized to patients because we do not want to keep giving insulin at very, very high doses. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? No questions.